So I will start by introducing our uh, facilitator for today, uh, Dr. Shaila Dolan from Arizona State University, Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. We uh, facilitate our discussion today. Uh, she received her uh, PhD from University of Arizona. Uh, also, it's like uh, she is uh, her like research expertise on refugee education, religion education, anthropology, uh, race, and race racism. Uh, for uh, she she is assistant professor in Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. And she will facilitate our great conversation for today. And I want to give stage to her. Thank you so much, Adnan. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. And for the sake of time, I actually condense um, their bios a little bit, which does not minimize certainly um, any of the wonderful things that they've been involved in or done. Um, and I, encourage everyone to read more about them. Um, so Patrick Masoyo um, came to Arizona more than 20 years ago as a refugee from the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's a graduate of Western International University, holding a BS in business, an MBA in finance from Grand Canyon University, and an MS in taxation from the University of Colorado, Denver. He's currently a partner at a tax and accounting firm and a board member at the National Small Business Association and president and CEO of Refugees and Immigrants Community of Empowerment. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Masoya, for being here. <clears throat> My pleasure. Thank um, you. Dr. Ruz thank you. Dr. Ruzbe Shirazi is an associate professor of comparative and international development education at the University of Minnesota. His work focuses on secondary and post-secondary education as arenas of cultural production and political struggle with an emphasis on youth and community organized educational counter spaces. Across these sites, Shirazi's research is guided by a commitment to interrupt and imagine alternatives to hegemonic and dehumanizing depictions of minoritized immigrant communities that animate contemporary migration educational policies, curricular resources, and pedagogical practices. Um, thank you very much for being here, Dr. Shirazi. Um, Awad is a fourth, thank you. Awad is a fourth year PhD student at the University of Arizona in the Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies program. His research focuses on the education of refugees and his area of study is language and identity. He is currently the education coordinator for refugee students at Lutheran Social Services of the Southwest and has more than 20 years of experience in K through 12 teaching, school administration, and social service work. Awad is originally from Sudan. Thank you for being here, Awad. Um, and, th and then um, last but certainly not least, Dr. Pedro DeLargi serves as the Executive Director of Education for Humanity, Pro Professor of Practice in the School of Political, of Politics and Global Studies and Advisor to the President at Arizona State University. Previously, she served as Senior Advisor to the UN Special Representative for Migration from 2014 to 2017. She was also a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics in 2016, conducting research on humanitarian response to mass migration. Prior to this, she was in the UN Population Fund for more than 20 years. She's a public health and migration specialist with, with specific expertise in the Horn of Africa. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. DeLarge. <clears throat> um, so briefly, I would just like to explain um, how we'll do this. So uh, essentially, we're going to try to, we only have an hour, so we're going to try to um, ask a series of questions, and our panelists will have the opportunity um, to respond uh, in two to three minutes apiece. You all are feel free to please use the chat feature in order to ask additional questions. If we don't get time, um, there's always the, the hope that at the end there'll be time for questions. But if, if that does not occur and there's not time for that, um, we can always ensure that you get an email back um, with a response to your question. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and jump right in. Um, for each of our panelists, um, maybe you could just share a little bit about your connection to the topic, 
um, personally or professionally. And any one of you can start. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just to uh, at ASU, um, and the Education for Humanity program is actually a global program to provide access to higher education for refugees. Many of you may know that uh, all around the world, you know, at least with support from the international community, elementary education and sometimes middle school level education is provided for refugee camps and urban settings. But higher education is much harder to come by. About 6% of refugees globally get access to higher education. So our Education for Humanity program is very much focused on that. Thank you very much. Um, Awad, would you like to go next? Sure, yeah. So personally, I'm part of the, um, the refugee community. I moved to Egypt as a refugee in 2003, end of 2003, um, and I've been like part of the refugee community moving to Tucson in 2008. Um, and I've worked most of my um, teaching jobs have been with refugees um, as um, a teacher, as an administrator, almost um, half of my career have been with refugees in Egypt and here in Al Huda Islamic School, which um, had a, um, a population, um, seven over 70% of the student <laughs> population were refugees. And, um, and then I also focused my um, studies to just, you know, um, you know, uh, I, I was so passionate to, um, you know, to just um, direct all my studies um, to help and research about refugee education, education, education of refugees. Currently, um, as you, um, you know, said in, 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 in the introduction, I work with um, a resettlement agency as a coordinator for refugee students, um, you know, to support refugee students through their um, um, schooling journey. Thank you very much, Tawad. Um, Dr. Shirazi? Yeah, thank you. Um, I should start by saying that I don't um, think of myself as a scholar of refugee education or working with refugee youth exclusively per se. Um, I think of the work that I do as um, speaking to some of the experiences that refugees commonly face that of coerced migration, displacement, um, racialization that ends up happening in different educational settings. And that's work that I've been doing for the better part of two decades um, in, in different sites, um, most recently in France. Um, but before that, actually here in um, Minnesota, looking at kind of the experiences of minoritized transnational youth or youth who, who, whose social practices and cultural forms, uh, social relationships span um, more than one uh, nation state. And um, before that in Jordan, um, where there has been uh, a history of um, waves of migration uh, due to the displacement of Palestinians uh, from their homes with the uh, creation of uh, Israel and the subsequent op occupations of the, the West Bank and, and Gaza. Um, but these are also questions that for me are rooted in personal experience as well too. I'm a child of displaced Iranian um, students and political activists who um, came to the U.S. to study and uh, circumstances uh, back home for them uh, changed suddenly. And so their kinds of uh, decisions and, and options available to them shifted as well, too. And so some of those considerations for me uh, have have certainly been part of uh, the work that I do and how I approach the, the, the research that I do. And in those aspects, uh, some elements of my field work began long before um, I ever made it to graduate school. Thank you so much. Um, 
Mr. Masoya, if I can, I'm going to call you Patrick, if that's okay. Would of you like course. to go next? <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> yes, um, you know, being a former refugee um, and uh, being in, in, a, in this country for more than 20 years, and also being involved with the refugee uh, population and migration, um, um, you know, we've seen, um, you know, different challenges that uh, in, uh, our, the, the refugee populations are facing. And I, I, I would like to apologize, my video is kind of shaking. I don't know why I think my connection is probably bad in the office here. So we do see uh, so many refugees here from uh, all over the world, uh, from the Congo, Sudan, Burundi, Rwanda, uh, Ukraine now, uh, and Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. When they come here, uh, we, you know, we see uh, a challenge, you know, in um, um, in the you know in the social integration, um, a challenge with the uh, educators uh, in the, uh, you know from the community college, from the high school to the community colleges. So. We see that you know a huge need, um, and our organization uh, effort is to uh, to find uh, you know some to identify some barriers, and uh, to you know to you know to come up with a solution that you know uh, will help them to you know to to be successful and also to um, to help the, you know the, to help them you know to achieve the, you know their lifetime go, uh, dream. Uh, from the you know from the uh, from the uh, the home country to the United States here, so that that part is very important to us. It's very essential, and also um, at the end, uh, you know, the goal, um, in our goal is to you know to empower them to make sure that uh, this population through the education can also connect you know with the uh, employer, so they can become employable by equipping them with, uh, you know, uh, enough skills for, you know, uh, for them to become employable, then so that they can become, you know, a great resource to the country. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in with some questions. Um, so I'm gonna ask these as a kind of a series of three and you guys can comment on um, whatever you would like. So in terms of, social integration um what is social integration um or social integration or integration policies how and where and by whom is it articulated and how do you define refugee or immigrant education um and dr delargy would you like to start that's a tough one um <laughs> i don't know i think uh, across the across the last 50 years of the US resett refugee resettlement program, there have been different definitions of social or economic integration. You know, early on, uh, someone was considered to be, you know, well integrated into society if they got a job, were able to pay their rent and, and had decent health care. I hope that we've come a long way <laughs> from that really minimalist determination of integration. Uh, and I think it's important to point out now that the, that the US resettlement policies and programs haven't changed over those past 50 years. And they, the policies themselves are really counterproductive when it comes to social, economic, cultural, uh, you know, uh, membership in, in American society. Our resettlement programs here require people to, you know, immediately jump in, get a job, pay the rent. Uh, that means many of them who are highly skilled say can't, don't have time to go back and get the credentials so that they're able to do what they were doing in their home country. It also means those who, who are coming afresh and might you know, be interested in having a higher education and developing their skills in any area, in any vocational area either, have trouble accessing that kind of education because they are forced to immediately become economically self-sufficient. And in this way, the US resettlement program differs very much from those programs in Europe or, or other places. So I think it's it's an, an interesting question, you know, it's, uh, it, a long time ago, it used to be determined, well, if, 
if the second generation immigrant were all completely fluent in English and that's what they spoke at home, then that was considered integration. <laughs> I think we've come a long way from there in recognizing the importance of multicultural, you know, uh, our multicultural society that people should be able to keep all of their cultures and languages and all of that and still be new Americans. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Awad, would you like to go next? Sure, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, um, it, it, it's a really tough question. Um, for me, I've seen different terms used interchangeably sometimes like acculturation, assimilation, um, integration. However, um, integration uh, uh, can take different forms and it can mean different things um, depending on the um, <clears throat> depending on the setting like in the resettle, um, Dr. Rosan, am I am I saying that right? Uh, the speaker before me? Rusben. Rusben, yeah. She mentioned self-sufficiency. And that the keyword we have in the agency, in the resettlement agency I work. Everyone is talking about sufficiency. And that basically mean um, they wanted everyone to learn the language, uh, English, get a job, and be self-sufficient, you know, and, and just integrate in. For them, for the resettlement agency at Lutheran, that's what integration for them mean. You go to school, you see all these language programs uh, where you have students, um, you know, um, like segregated in these ELL classes, and they wanted to, um, they're, they're, you know, um, set to learn the English, which for the school system is the, the first piece of integration. Um, I have a curriculum that I use with my refugee students and refugee families. When you go to, um, like we do a lot of home visits and you see all this panic from the parents, they're, um, they sometimes talk directly to you. They want it. They're so scared that the next day their daughter will come with a boyfriend at home. They're so afraid from integration. Um, that's what integration means for them. Um, so I came up with this idea um, that uh, in, included in my curriculum that I use with parents and students from the refugee population, um, trying to come with this idea of emerging culture. You know. Um, you know, using I've I've seen the word acculturation used in a in in a way to 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 have some to you know share some kind of positive um, connotation to mean you know you can you can adapt you can embrace some of the uh, some aspects from the American culture but you can still that doesn't mean you have to lose your your culture of origin you know so you don't have to fully integrate into the American culture, but you can, you can, um, you know, your child. So what I'm trying to um, help my parents understand is, you know, your child cannot, um, it's like, you know, cannot be, is not Syrian anymore, like fully Syrian, cannot grow up being Syrian, um, you know, fully Syrian, but he doesn't necessarily have to be fully American, but you can combine the two cultures and, you know, um, have this emerging culture coming and having your, uh, you know, you can expect that your, your student will have uh, this new identity of being like, you know, Syrian American. Um, so it's, it's really, it takes different, um, you know, different shapes and different, um, you know, can be defined in so different ways um, in a school and in, 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 in this, you know, outside in the community in in public and the agencies and then um, every and also depending on the on the goal of the agency and the institution institution. Thank you so much, Awad. Um, Dr. Shirazi, would you like to comment on this question? Sure, thank you, and uh, please feel free to call me Ruzba. I don't want to stand on on ceremony. Um, integration is a funny word. Um, I've been trying to think about what 
I want to say and how I can collect my thoughts. Um, and I think one of the things that's Im important here um, is, um, you know, the way in which we um, work with things. And so I kind of look at how things uh, materialize in everyday practice, right? So if integration is a doing, what does that look like for um, refugee or immigrant youth? And, and what does that look like in educational settings? And um, I, I come to this from um, a critical um, perspective. And that perspective, in a sense, compels me to always ask, integrate into what? And so that um, point of, of departure for me has necessitated looking at, you know, what is considered to be normative, right? So integration is something to become part of something, to become part of a larger whole. And um, for many people who are in positions of um, uh, forced migration um, and ha or being displaced, a lot of times uh, the the conditions that contrib contribute to that, and not exclusively, I mean, we, we'd have to really parse things out looking case by case. Um, I can talk about my own family history, for example. Um, the reason that, you know, there is a large Iranian community in, in the U.S. in many respects um, can be understood to, there have been different waves of migration, obviously, but one of the reasons was because of the 1979 revolution um, in which a uh, US backed monarch was overthrown um, in, and the dominant register of, of protests was certainly along a more Islamist line, but the, the support for overthrowing the Shah was very broad based. Part of what led to that was the fact that the Shah suppressed um, political uh, dissent, political opposition, um, both through sanctioned channels and unsanctioned channels, um, and did so with the backing of the U.S. Um, so when we talk about this, like some of the the forms of of um, migration are due to foreign policy interventions that have happened uh, over time and intergenerationally. Um, so what debt is really owed, in a sense, for people who are displaced or or um, forced to to leave, uh, quote unquote, home because of of outside interventions, coup d'etats. I mean, there have been many of them. We look at um, Iran in 1953 was the test case, but then you have Guatemala, you have Chile, you have Granada, you have many other countries where these kinds of interventions happened. Um, I'm saying this because part of the charge to integrate as well, too, um, there's often this like magnanimous kind of like offer of membership that that kind of accompanies that like you can be part of this you can become a citizen you can also become an american and to me it's it's important for us to query what exactly that means i think there's a, a unspoken commitment to american exceptionalism that somehow this is a exceptional nation that that it's a polity that um is again uh city um on the shining city on the hill kind of narrative. And in, and in many cases, the, the, the realities of um, life in the US, of racialization in the US, of inequality in the US are very stark and people start to experience those um, not long after migrating here uh, or, or relocating here in a sense. So um, to me, I, I try to think about this question of integration as integration into what and to, and to push back on, I think, some of the unspoken normative commitments that are there, that somehow this is like something desirable that we want to integrate into, um, or that, they're, that that it's somehow beneficial uh, for all. And, and I think some of the contradictions that exist there that people have to reconcile in terms of the narratives that they're told about what is being, what is on offer with respect to integration and what the actual promises are or the realities are, are, are very different. Um, if only it was as simple as go to school, learn English well, and go, get good grades, and then everything else will work out. I mean, I, I know from um, my own personal experience that doesn't stop uh, a lot of the other forms of uh, discrimination or, or, or racialization that end up happening as well too. So I think um, there's 
some there's room for us there to play with this concept in of itself and really to ask uh, a broader question of what does it mean to become part of and what is it that we're actually being asked or or in a sense um expected to join right and expect to join with some measure of gratitude thank you so much um patrick would you like to comment on this question as well absolutely uh thank you i see a uh, social integration for the refugee uh in two part one is um you know how prepared the refugees are to um you know to, to embrace the new culture to the host country uh you know coming from a different country refugee um they have you know a massive uh, amount of experience and cultural differences that uh, they will have to, uh, you know, to be prepared, you know, either one to, uh, you know, to give away or, you know, to, um, to integrate to the new, uh, to the new society. So with that, uh, you know, uh, there might be some other challenges that uh, the refugee will, uh, will face once in the host country. So in the social integration, um, the question, you know, I always ask, uh, you, know, my, you know, our population is whether they, will, they are willing, you know, they are prepared and willing to embrace their new culture and to make the new, uh, the, you know, the host society as their, you know, as a new society and, you know, uh, adjust and adapt to that new uh, culture and how do, how do we make those, uh, you know, to, uh, together and, uh, you know, call your neighbor a neighbor and um, also, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, adapt, you know, to the way of living. So this is a challenge I see, uh, you know, like, you know, the previous, uh, you know, speaker said, it's, you know, it, it is a tough question. And uh, I see it more as a challenge, you know, when we, uh, you know, when we employ, you know, uh, you know uh, using that word uh, social integration, it's not an easy one, you know, to, uh, uh you know to you know to uh to implement and uh, you also have another uh, uh challenge with the host society uh you know are they re ready uh, the readiness the level of readiness to to accept you know the new host you know in the society so these are two uh different challenges one you know one has to be prepared and you know the other has to be uh you know have to be ready you know to accept uh you know the uh you know the new host in their society and then you know with that you know you have uh issue uh many challenges uh through uh you know culture you know um new life uh, style in America, you know, whereas, you know, some of the family, you might have uh, teenager daughters or, you know, adult uh, 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 child in your living, you know, in your house. In some of the culture, it's okay for an adult uh, child to live with the family, uh, you know, until they get married, especially a daughter or even a son until, you know, he, uh, he graduates from college then get a job and go, but in you know in our society here it might not be the norm. So this is one of the challenge we, you know we might face here, and we see uh, parent you know coming from different countries um, having you know uh, some issue with the law enforcement and schools because the way of you know the you know they they want to. Uh, to, uh, to educate the children in their own uh, in the household so that's become an issue now the question and the challenge we have how do we help those uh, new uh, our host family you know to adapt you know to accept you know you know to you know to adapt to uh, you know uh, uh, to the you know to the uh, to this new uh, social integration you know for, uh, you know for them to accept you know, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to make those changes. So it's always, you know, a, a challenge. Then we have the host uh, society here. Uh, you know, some of the resettlement agency that, you know, I'm sure, you know, uh, our, you know, colleague here from the Lutheran will probably share with us uh, later, but some of them, you know, they have challenges with, with family coming here, uh, having, you know, to face those, you know, difficult challenge, you know, how to adapt, you know, with those norms in America. How do we, you know, how do we want to raise our children in the new society so these are challenges so i see it as a challenge uh you know um you know uh, for the you know for our uh, for the refugee you know for the refugee population you know coming to uh, especially in america europe or any other country you know when you know at, at each time when you move even for you know from one uh 
from you move from one location to another, there's always a challenge. So social integration, it's a big challenge, but, uh, you know, the key is, you know, how prepare the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, um, the refugees are, you know, when they move into this new, uh, the new uh, environment, and then how ready uh, the host environment is, uh, society is, uh, you know, in uh, accepting the new culture. And at the end of the day, uh, our ultimate goal is to build, you know, to, to, you know to, to put this together and to come up with a solution that will help us to build, you know, a safer, a safer environment, which pleases both sides. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, and thank you all for those wonderful responses. Um, so I'm going to post the next question. Um, to what extent do the current education systems, policies, and practice, praxis, sorry, address migrants' social integration needs or challenges? Um, Dr. Delargy, would you like to comment on this question? Oh, you are on, you are on mute. Um, maybe we also need to back up a little bit. Uh, I really appreciated all the speakers' inputs uh, and responses to the earlier questions, but um, we're we're lumping a lot of people together here: immigrants and refugees and migrants and all of that. And and maybe just to to think about how these questions play out with, with different groups. If we're thinking about uh, simply the difference between say immigrants and refugees, you know, are we, we're determining whether people move voluntarily, whether people were forcibly uh, relocated, whether people were in a camp for a long, long time and, but had a kind of normalized school system and everything, or whether people were abruptly moved, uh, such as the Afghan evacuation um, two summers ago. All these, all these experiences are very different. They have different levels of trauma. They have different levels of, of attitudes developed toward being in the US. <laughs> I liked what Rosetta was saying earlier too about that. The largest number of people crossing the border right now uh, in Arizona are Cubans. And that's a direct result of U.S. policy to Cuba over the past however many years. Um, so it's very hard to lump, you know, all of these groups together and think about how our education system is responding to them, whether it's responding appropriately or not. Uh, just to point out, too, it makes a difference, you know, the, however we want to define integration or acculturation, it makes a difference whether people from that point of origin were already in the US as well. Um, it's quite different, I think, for, for those coming, say, from, from Guatemala or El Salvador um, here to Arizona, for instance, where there are already those communities. Uh, then it was for the Bhutanese refugees to arrive here, where there was not really a community of Bhutanese. And whether there is a kind of host of the same language, of the same ethnicity, um, to, to help people settle in makes a big difference, I think. Um, even if we think about, uh, just thinking about what's happening in Arizona across the years, all the different groups that have come, one might assume that, uh, for instance, you know, Sudanese community who was here a long, long time ago might welcome the, the newer Sudanese coming. I, I'm sure that Awad will agree to me to say that's that's not always the case. It depends on ethnicity. It depends on when people came. So just to point out that one factor that that can help or hinder is the presence of people from that country of origin to begin with. Related to the question then about how our education systems are responding, um, if we have really good attention to the needs of very different types of, of young people. Let's say if we're looking at elementary education, we're not only looking at English language provision, but looking at needs for trauma care, trauma-informed instruction, um, attention to particular ethnic or racial or religious issues. 
uh, is very important as well. And I think uh, it's an interesting history here in Arizona in terms of bilingual education going back and forth on that policy. It would be interesting to compare that to, to other states as well. But, um, you know, there, there are attempts over the years, but especially to help Spanish speaking young people. But what are we doing about, you know, a large influx of Arabic speaking? young people where you've got not only a language difference and an alphabet difference, but also perhaps religious differences as well. Thank you, Dr. Delargy. Um, Awad, would you like to comment on this question? Sure, yeah. And thank you so much, Dr. Um, Delargy. Um, I think you are so right about, um, you know, um, like trying to differentiate between all these categories, like different categories of immigrants, refugees, and you know, asylees, and 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 it it's it makes a lot of difference, and and that leads also the, to this current question, the um, whether the um, the education system, the policies, or you know, or um, teachers, or whether they're ready to um, to respond to all these different categories, you know, in in like in an appropriate way based on their experiences, um, you know, whether they're ready, whether they're forced to come, um, the amount of trauma they have, and I've seen a lot of challenges working with teachers, you know, um, you know, in the um, K, at least the K twelve um, education system. Um, there is a lot of question about the um you know the 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 curriculum and the teacher preparation you know um i i use uh, like one of the services that we provide my department provides um for the the district is uh, pro the pd for teachers you know to you know to just inf inform them inform them about um refugees and and how and how they um you know how they um how they can respond to their different needs you know and i've seen a lot of um challenges um teachers are struggling a lot to just respond to the to the needs of the um the refugee students um so um i think like you know to answer this question it's 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 uh, you know, it, it's not a simple, um, you know, yes and no answer for whether the system, um, the education system or the policies or, you know, is, is ready to respond to this um, um, population of, of different categories, whether they're refugees or immigrants. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of work need to be done. There is a lot of support from outside the district, from outside the education system need to be, um, you know, need to be um, delivered to the education system. And, and I'm, I'm like as close as I am, I've always, I've, you know, always see uh, more challenges and more questions raised um, by teachers and 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 it you know it drives a lot of more questions actually. Thank you, Awad. Um, Patrick, so I'm just trying to kind of mix up the order here a little bit. Patrick, would you like to comment? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> this you know this will depend on um, uh, different uh, you know uh, each district uh, you know school district. Uh, where the refugee are being placed, um, you know, in some district, uh, you know, like in Scottsdale, uh, Paradise Valley, uh, Union Hills, you don't have a you know, a huge amount of refugees there. So school district there, they may, uh, you know, um, uh, teachers, you know, they may may not be uh, uh, well trained, you know, to um, you know, to adapt, you know, to uh, uh, 
you know, to accept this new population uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, the curriculum. So I, and I know that I understand that, you know, this might be a statewide uh, curriculum, but I feel like the, you know, there should be more to, uh, more need to be done in, the, in terms of, uh, you know, a statewide curriculum, uh, tr making sure that uh, each district, uh, you know, have, you know, a well-trained staff, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to better educate this population. Uh, so I see uh, again, uh, you know, like you know, like I, I've, I've, I've mentioned in my previous, uh, you know, uh, statement that I see it as a challenge. Um, but the uh, the most important thing is the uh, how do we um, educate our uh, train our uh, educators so that they can be ready, you know, to. Uh, you know, to have a diverse uh, curriculum, you know, in order to help, you know, to make sure that, you know, the new, uh, uh, the newcomers in the school district um, are also ready, you know, are, uh, are also ready to, um, you know, to adapt to, to, to that new curriculum. So I think for me, I see more, like, more as, more, uh, I see more need in, you know, in terms of trainings in our uh, district and uh, different colleges and you know in our educators if they can get you know a more training in uh, in uh, cultural diversity and uh, in the refugee population and uh, it, it gets very confusing when you use the terms uh, asylee immigrant and refugees uh, it gets very very confusing but at the end of the day they are all immigrants that you know uh, migrating the united states here so or you know in the host countries so uh, I think that's the that's where the uh, the uh, the challenge might be. So I I think more trainings uh, you know need to be done. Thank you so much, Bruce Bay. Yeah, um, lots of good things said here, and you know just to pick up on I think the question of terminology, I think that's really important. Yeah, like people's. Uh, migration trajectories and and histories matter matter very much in, in determining kind of what sort of uh, supports might be warranted. Um, that being said, I think there is also um, limitations to some of the ter terminology because the terminology is a, ultimately a legal category and legal categories are deployed capriciously. They're not always deployed in, in uniform ways or de deployed sub subjectively because if we look at, for example, uh, UNHCR's definition of, of refugee, right? It says refugees are people who have fled war, violence, conflict, or persecution, and have crossed an international border to find safety in another country. Um, that uh, fits uh, the experiences. That's a descriptor that, that fits the experiences of a lot of people. But um, as far as being legible and recognized as a refugee, that's an entirely different um, proposition altogether. I, you know, just an example from my work in France, for example, there were a lot of people who had come from Syria, who had come from Afghanistan, and um, because of the way in which the, the, the time, time stamping of conflict and migration was happening, um, people who were um, from Syria were eligible to, to file uh, for, for asylum, were able to kind of petition for that status, whereas people in uh, from Afghanistan were not. And so um, the, the usage and the deployment and assignment of the terminology itself, um, I think we have to we have to attend to that as well too. I think the other thing here um, in terms of uh, of thinking about what's actually happening or not, it's a it's a it's a really big question. Uh, I can only really speak from the context in which I've worked in because again, I'm not looking, at like a, a larger level kind of systems wide analysis. I do deep ethnographic work. It's situated in uh, particular schools in particular settings. So um, I tend to kind of look at how these things materialize in, in everyday practice. And um, I think again, this, this kind of uh, deficit framing that's often there when you look at students who um, regardless of how uh, they may be categorized, but in this case, let's say, you know, um, newcomer youth or refugee youth. Um, in many instances, the teachers that I had a chance to work with or observe, there's a latent uh, kind of assumption of some sort of like academic deficit. And uh, whereas there may have been interruption in schooling due to conflict or due to migration, um, that doesn't mean that people don't think, that doesn't mean that people don't have their own kind of understandings of what's happening. 
and that they don't register differential treatment. And in some cases, I, I think um, there isn't enough room. Now, often, I think there's not enough room to um, look at uh, youth themselves as holders of knowledge, uh, their families as kind of possessing of knowledge and knowledge that they can share that can actually improve and benefit um, the services or the educational kind of like um, uh, programs or or the pedagogy, right? That's that's directed to them. So um, one of the things that I think is is often um, missing here is actually um, uh, a speaking with and 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 collaboration with rather than a speaking for. Thank you so much, Rizbe. Um I'm going to present one more question. Um, I'm going to give all of the speakers a one minute time limit and um, I'll just essentially interrupt you, which I'm great at doing. You should ask my husband. Um, I'm very good at interrupting, which I will do. And so um, the next question is, what are some of the strengths or areas and in integration approaches that need improvement and collaboration across the ecosystem? Um, and Rosbe, I know you just finished speaking, but since you went last, if you would like to go first um, and comment on this, please feel free to do so. I'm, I'm like 10 seconds into this minute of mine and uh, not any real uh, cl closer. I, I mean, I, I think this is the work, right? I, I think some of this right now is that I don't think there's a, there's a, um, one size fits all kind of magic bullet that's happening here. And, and again, because uh, histories uh, are different and, and kind of like um, communities are different, the, the level that the kind of, uh, uh, as we were talking about earlier, if there is kind of a, a presence uh, of a similar um, ethnic or racial group or linguistic group in some ways that might facilitate some of these practices as well too, because the institutions aren't going to be able to provide everything, right? Like in, in many cases, people are looking for supports um, because the institutions aren't going to be able to do everything. Um, so I, I think just uh, looking at the places where, where students are thriving, I, I think looking at places where again, the, the impetus is not on um, learn how to be here, uh, where there's room to kind of transform the notion of an us rather than this is how you should become are going to be the places of uh, hope and and imagining and 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 more uh, equity and and justice uh, essentially. So that's that's a real thirty thousand feet from above perspective, but that's what I got in a minute. Thank you very much, Patrick. Would you like to comment? Uh well, you no, know, I don't have any comment um, in this uh, question. Okay, um, Awad. Sure, yeah. So I think the biggest flow in um, you know um, developing curriculum or um, you know um, for refugees or you know in the having them part of the education system is you know when you talk about integration or or, uh, you know, adjustment or acculturation, you know, adjusting someone to something, you that means you have to um, consider the origin. Like, there should be one thing I think that the, um, that the uh, education system or policymakers do not consider is the, what do they have? Like, you know, that should be the start point because if you are adjusting something to something, that means there is an original point where you have to start. So considering the backgrounds of the refugees, considering the knowledge they come with, I'm a big fan of uh, funds of knowledge, which is not fully considered in, when developing, um, you know, a curriculum or um, um, like any platform for the refugee or any immigrants, you know, of, of the other categories as well. So I think the biggest um, problem that the policymakers have is not considering, um, you know, what refugees, what immigrants have with them, what they bring with them, um, and make that the start point for any work that, you know, um, um, they wanted to develop in the education system. Thank you so much, Awad. And um, Dr. Delargy, please. Hey, I'm pleased. 
Yeah, I would say, if I have to answer in one minute, two very practical things. We absolutely have to do better, develop a better system for re-credentialing and recertifying those who come to the US with certain skills. That is everything from higher education to other kinds of vocations and, and trades. Um, if we can do that faster, people will be able to move back into their occupations, make their own lives better and support their, their children better too. Um, secondly, I would say within school systems, including in higher education, we need much more attention to trauma-informed instruction. Um, that, that is critical from, from K through, through, through university level. Um, and lastly, I would say also, we need to figure out ways to support community involvement with, uh, with refugee, arriving refugees. Um, in Arizona, we're really lucky. We've very long had bipartisan support for refugee resettlement, which is not always the case in every state. Um, but uh, if we notice what has happened, for instance, with the arrival of, of Afghans and with Ukrainians right now, there is a lot of community involvement. Churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, civic clubs, um, all kinds of groups who are reaching out and trying to work together. And our local governments are encouraging that. I think it's very important for local government to support those kinds of efforts for community outreach, because that is really the only way that we get people understanding uh, the challenges being faced by refugees arriving and also developing programs to respond to them. Thank you so much. Um, so we have time for about two to three questions. Um, if you all could post your questions into uh, the chat, that would be great. Shaila, I'm not seeing many oh, questions mm -hmm. coming, but maybe right. I'm just thinking, I, I see Charles Shipman is here in the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And it's worth mentioning the study that was done a few years ago about challenges for refugee integration in Arizona or in the Phoenix area. And English language <laughs> was by far the most important challenge. But the other challenges also were finding decent employment uh, that either related to, to, to skills people already had. Um, and then another was transportation. So sometimes they're just very practical nitty gritty issues that if we can improve people's access to transportation, uh, to get to work, to, to get to school, that can make a big difference. So it's, uh, we're, we're talking here about everything from thinking and, and emotional issues about acceptance of people from other cultures to down to the nitty gritty of making sure everybody has a bus pass. Thank you. So we do have um, one question from Jennifer Taylor. Um, how as an individual teacher support my student that has experienced trauma in his journey? Would anyone like to comment? I, I'll, I'll say this, uh, Jennifer, I think that, um, you know, that's incredibly hard work. And we've talked about the importance of getting uh, school wide or district wide supports as well, too. And I, so I don't think it's an individual task. Um, without knowing anything more about your students circumstances, I think making sure uh, there's a sustained kind of push for uh, trauma informed counselors. And that's oftentimes, uh, you know, I've noticed this in work, that's soft money, you know, so those positions are, uh, they're here one year and they might have some good impact. And then the following year, because of certain cutbacks, they're, they're not. So I think uh, pushing for, for uh, stronger, longer term, more stable commitments for that type of support for students experiencing that uh, 
uh, whether or not they're, they're refugees or, or migrants who have experienced trauma on their journeys, but just trauma in general is something that, that is um, a reality for many youth uh, and people right now. So it, being open about that and acknowledging, it, I think is really important. I think I would reinforce that and say that any skills you build in this area of dealing with trauma are gonna benefit all students, not just refugee and immigrant students. And we know that COVID pandemic had some serious effects on all students. I do, though I wanna give um, each of you a chance to respond to that question. I do want to go ahead and address this one because I think it's connected. Um, I wonder if Dr. Gillard, you could explain further about trauma-informed instruction and how it has been integrated in, for example, teacher prep programs in Arizona. And any of you can comment on that. I am no expert on the education <laughs> teacher training in Arizona. I just know that we've also introduced trauma-informed instruction, for instance, to the staff at Global Launch at ASU, who are doing English language training. And that made a big difference with, with training of a lot of our, our students at ASU. Probably somebody from Teachers College knows more about this than I do. Um, through my agency, um, I don't know if you are part of the school district, any of the school districts in um, Tucson, but we provide, um, I will leave my contact information in the chat. Um, we offer, teacher training and um, especially in the um, trauma informed um, uh, you know um, training if you would like to contact me then we can um, it's a grant that is um, offered by the department of economic like grant that is um, you know to provide all these services and part of that is the uh, professional development for teachers in, but only in Tucson. So if you are part of any of the district in Tucson, you can contact me and then we can talk further um, in um, you know, having something like that for your district or your teachers. Thanks for organizing this. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Doc. Um, um... Uh, thank you for the invite. Um, I, this was great, and I'm looking forward to uh, to more of this. Thank you all for um, coming. I did just want to um, thank the speakers once again, and also remind you all um, that the next conversation in this series will be on March 30th, and it will focus on language education policy. If you have further questions, um, please feel free to email directly to any of the speakers. Um, the, the all of their email addresses and contact information are on the original flyer to the event. Thank you all for attending and um, thank you again to our um, speakers.